the second half of the session on criminal law and context. And we've got uh, two papers in this session. Uh, we've got Rinal Satish, and then we've got uh, Zaratna Kapoor. And Rinal will speak first on the repressive state, preventive justice, and Indian criminal law, picking up some of the themes from this morning. Good afternoon. And uh, the paper that I'm speaking on, sorry, not that I have a good paper ready yet, uh, is on the preventive uh, state and looking at how uh, Indian criminal law is heading towards the preventive state with very little uh, uh, principles behind that and very little rule of law uh, protection. So to make this uh, argument, what I propose to do is to look at uh, two basic uh, or the, the two most important writings on this issue. One is first by Professor Stryker and then the uh, work by Professor Andrew Ashworth and Professor Zegner on the preventive uh, state where they look at uh, predominantly uh, England and Wales and, uh, and, and the US and trace how the criminal law in these uh, jurisdictions are moving towards a preventive state. And I'm, I'm trying to examine uh, the same context in India and uh, look at what both the legislature and courts have done um, in this context. So uh, the term the preventive state was coined by uh, Carol Steiker in 1998 to describe the array of measures employed in the United States and to quote, to prevent or prophylactically deter as opposed to investigate crime and to incapacitate or treat as opposed to punish wrongdoers. So this was the conception behind the uh, preventive state in the US as uh, Stryker puts it. Um, and so Ashworth and Zedner then divide the preventive state into seven categories and consider coercive preventive measures involving the loss of liberty. And these seven categories are uh, preventive powers in police and criminal procedure, civil preventive orders, preventive criminal offenses, preventive sentences, preventive counterterrorism measures, preventive aspects of public health law, and preventive aspects of immigration law. So these are the seven categories that they uh, look at in their, um, in their book. So what I'm going to do is uh, examine some of these in the context of Indian criminal law and look at what <coughs> is happening in Indian criminal law and see whether it's the same, uh, is it the same story as uh, in other common law jurisdictions. So I begin by looking at the question of uh, pre-trial detention. And pre-trial detention, as all of us know, is, is a big issue uh, in the Indian uh, context. It begins with arrest. Uh, if we look at the criminal procedure code, we don't have something similar to a probable cause. So therefore, arrest is something that you, you register a first information report, and the first thing you do is arrest the person, uh, the suspect or the person as uh, put down in the first information report. Um, the Supreme Court has repeatedly tried to grapple with this question of unnecessary arrest. Uh, telling the police to not arrest people unless absolutely necessary, especially in crimes which are punishment for less than seven years, uh, to uh, looking at what is the purpose of arrest. The purpose of arrest is to have that person in custody for interrogation, and if you want to get that person uh, in the police station in any way, what, what is the need to, um, need to arrest such a person? Unfortunately, most of the jurisprudence in the context of unlawful or unnecessary arrest has been in the gender context where uh, section 498A of the Indian Penal Code is then looked at as uh, as a provision where people allegedly file false cases and then fam uh, fam entire families are arrested and so the jurisprudence around unnecessary arrest is built around uh, section 498A with the most important case, Arnesh Kumar, which laid down guidelines with respect to why, uh, why we shouldn't be arresting people in offenses less than seven years, calling 498A legal terrorism. And so uh, we developed that law within the framework of offenses, uh, of social offenses or crimes against women. 
and uh, so one part of the judgment is progressive in one way and the other part is absolutely regressive in what the Supreme Court uh, also tries to say. So the message there in most of these cases is, yeah, in these offenses that involve domestic violence, there's no need to really, uh, no need to arrest. Uh, and we extend that to everything else. But the message that the police seem to get is that you don't need to arrest in domestic violence, right? But you can arrest in everything uh, everything else, so therefore you still pick up people even if the punishment is uh, uh, is less than seven years. Then we get into the question of pre-trial detention. The Supreme Court of India, the Chief Justice a few days back, as all of us know, has his grand plans of listening to 5,200 petitions in the uh, during the vacation. Uh, courts across high courts across the country have this thing of. The first priority cases are cases which are pending with people in custody for more than three years, five years, seven years, uh, etc. Today's newspaper had a case, if I'm not wrong, of someone, uh, a criminal case running for 23 years, which was uh, decided by Delhi High Court uh, yesterday. So, why are these people uh, in custody either during the trial or during the uh, appellate process? Now, when we look at criminal procedure anywhere across the world, we are told that yeah, you need to keep a person in custody to ensure that the person does not abscond. Uh, or if the person may tamper with witnesses or intimidate and threaten them. So these are the first two categories. So therefore, the in bail law, the entire question then becomes risk assessment. So is this person likely to abscond? And risk assessment has become more a property and financial capacity uh, issue. So you assess the risk of whether a person is going to abscond by looking at whether that person has property or capacity to uh, to pay uh, to uh, to pay bail. And although Justice Krishna a long time back said bail is rule and jail the exception, it is jail is the rule and bail is continues to be the exception. We also have a very interesting provision in Section 437, Capital A of the Criminal Procedure Code which says that even if a person is acquitted by the trial court, pending appeal in the in an appellate court, you have to give surety. So a person may be acquitted, but you take surety from that person saying, we may need you in an appellate court, so until you are acquitted all the way up to the Supreme Court, you continue to pay uh, surety because we, we think you are going to, uh, you're going to abscond. Then we have the other category of what about people who may be offended. And here is, 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 the, is the part where uh, there's really no concrete law on the issue. Uh, for instance, I'll take three statutes. One is Narcotic Drugs and Psychotropic Substances Act. Second is the Protection of Children from Sexual Offenses Act. And the third is a call of anti-terror legislations. Although these statutes provide for bail, it is as good as having no bail. Because the way these statutes are framed, they say that the judge has to certify that this person is not guilty of having committed that offense. So at a pre-trial stage, even before maybe the charging has happened, the judge has to certify that this person is not guilty of the offense. And that this person is not likely to be offended. So the principle behind that is the preventive state model where you're saying that I think that I as a judge has to certify, have to certify that you will not be offended. So therefore, I rather keep you in custody rather than uh, have you be offended by releasing you on bail. Uh, so you have extended free trial detention. In some of the research that I'm doing, uh, looking at how many cases are pending in courts, in, in the lower, uh, in the trial courts, for more than three years, we found that in one prison in the Tihar jail complex here in Delhi, there are 323 people in custody for more than three years without being released on bail. These offenses are either narcotic drugs, or the Protection of Children from Sexual Offenses Act, or homicide. So 
you have one of these three offenses. And the, again, if you look at the case record, you look at what's happening in the case, the assessment is pedophiles, again, it's not proved yet, are likely to reoffend. So I, it's better to keep them in custody rather than release them. People who are in prison under the Narcotic Drugs Act are not either the drug users or the kingpins. You have all the couriers. So therefore, these couriers are too dangerous to put back into society, which is itself a wrong assumption to make because the courier is the most dispensable part of that cycle because one goes into prison, you get another uh, one. So therefore, keep these people in prison for extended uh, periods of time. Courts have been absolutely unwilling to take a principled approach here, which is why I said it doesn't seem to be a legal framework to cover this. Uh, in the context of the Terrorism and Disruptive Activities Act, uh, TADA, uh, in the 1990s, we had the Supreme Court repeatedly saying that the bail provisions are constitutional, and there's nothing wrong in having a provision which says that the person has, uh, that the judge has to certify that the person has not uh, is not guilty of the offence or keeping the person in custody, um, incapacitating them so that they don't commit any more uh, offences. Um, so how do you make these assessments of dangerousness or possibility of reoffending by the person? Is it empirically justified? And most studies in the context of drug offences, especially the people the, that they have in prison, show that these are all first time offenders. Uh, and you keep them in prison for 14 years and uh, there's another set of people out. So uh, whether they really will re-offend if you're trying to actually certify or find that out is not uh, possible. What the court has also been doing in the context, uh, the Supreme Court has been doing in the context of bail adjudication in India, again in terms of drugs and terror, is framing the question as individual liberty versus national security. And the moment you frame it as liberty versus national security, they always say, you know, national security trumps individual liberty. So therefore, in the interest of keeping the country safe, we need to keep these people in, um, in, in free trial uh, custody. Recently, also in economic crimes, uh, the Supreme Court seems to articulate that, you know, these people involved in these multi-million, um, literally multi-million dollar scams, uh, are really going to get away, so free trial detention is the time, is punishment uh, for them. And so saying that economic crimes really hamper the, the security, economic security of the country, which is why these people cannot cannot be released on bail. So same sort of formulation uh, uh, once again. So that's one category where, you, where it's about free trial detention and bail. The other category that I'd like to uh, focus on is uh, definitional aspects of some of the offenses uh, that we have. Crimes of possession, again, the Narcotic Drugs Act, the Arms Act, uh, uh, a legislation where we have literally thousands and thousands of people uh, in prison who we then push towards our new favorite tool of plea bargaining, saying that, uh, why don't you plea bargain? Because uh, it's a two-year sentence, they already served out the one year minimum, might as well get out right now rather than uh, serve out the other one year. Um, the assumption again of, of danger in that situation. Of course now as we know we are moving to criminalizing possession of beef uh, and possession of alcohol in uh, some of our states and again it's the same uh, framework. You are criminalizing minorities, interfering with people's uh, food habits and making them this dangerous category of uh, people. Then we also have crimes of membership, membership of a terrorist group. Right? And we recently had a uh, case in Delhi where uh, people were acquitted after being in prison for more than 12 years under trial. The only section you could find to convict a person was membership at a uh, group on, uh, which is prohibited under the Unlawful Activities uh, uh, Prevention Act. <coughs> So like I mentioned in the abstract, we're trying to criminalize uh, or get rid of dissent by uh, criminalizing certain groups and just membership of the group will get you in, into prison for a long period of time. 
Then we have the mandatory reporting provisions, which are now a new fad in most of our legislations. Um, be it in the Protection of Children from Sexual Offenses Act, um, sexual harassment laws, uh, rape law, and the recent Mental Health Act of 2017, uh, which says that if you think that the person who suffers from mental health issues, you can inform the police who then pick up that person and put that person in the mental health home. Right? This is what we have in that legislation. Uh, that, so you have a mandatory reporting provision with respect to mental health of your neighbor, for, uh, uh, for instance. And again, giving that police power and saying that you can keep this person in police custody for 24 hours before you send them to a, a mental health uh, a, a establishment. Um, Similarly, like I said, the mandatory reporting provisions in various of these uh, sexual offences, I personally believe, really take away the autonomy of a woman to decide as to whether she wants to complain or not. And pushing a woman into the criminal process when she probably, in cases where she does not want to, without having a level of counselling as to what you ex what would happen if you get into uh, the criminal justice system. Similarly, in the Criminal Law Amendment Act of 2013, in the rape law, we inter uh, in, uh, introduced new forms of offenses which also go into the uh, process of incapacitation. We brought in felony murder uh, in Section 376A of the Indian Penal Code, saying if in the process of committing rape you uh, cause death, then that is uh, an offense without looking at the mens rea requirement of homicide. And then in 376E, uh, we want to incapacitate uh, repeat offenders for their entire life, saying these people are too dangerous, without trying to define what a repeat uh, offender is. Who is considered a repeat offender is not clear in Section 376, uh, Chapter E. Along the same lines, uh, in, our, in our sentencing regime, we are now slowly moving to extended indefinite life sentences, extended sentences or indefinite uh, life sentences. Are these meant to be punitive or are these preventive? The articulation at least by the legislature or court is looking at it more as preventive than uh, punitive because if it were punitive, then you would look at questions of proportionality, you would look at the other theories of punishment like rehabilitation, rehabilitation. but here you are saying that this person is too dangerous, so incapacitation is a theory of punishment. Uh, that we have used. So therefore, we are uncomfortable in giving a death sentence, so we will have indefinite extended life sentences uh, where we would keep the person in the, uh, prison for the rest of their life. Similarly, under the Criminal Amendment Act of 2013, uh, we introduced natural life uh, sentences, again without uh, any framework to, uh, to decide on who are these people who should be getting these sentences, what is the principle behind uh, this sort of, uh, of sentencing and the introduction of mandatory minimums across various uh, statutes. Mm -hmm. Taking away judicial discretion uh, in sentencing, which is something I argue against you know, in my other work on sentencing, that having mandatory minimums is really counterproductive to, uh, uh, to prosecution and punishment <laughs> in any uh, sort of statutes, especially in the context of rape law, which, uh, which I study. Um, and the other thing in terms of prevention is is the, is the proposal to have sex offender uh, registries with the understanding that yeah, you make sex offender registries, put it in the public so then uh, you know who the offender is and so you, you, you are careful in that context. Uh, I have a few minutes left. So, so finally, uh, I also want to concentrate on preventive detention provisions of the criminal law. Article 22 is something that uh, is often spoken about, but I want to talk about the most subtle forms of preventive detention. Uh, which is section 151 of the Criminal Procedure Code, which provides the police the power to arrest someone if they believe that that person may commit a cognizable uh, offence. The section says that the person can be kept in custody for 24 hours, but if the magistrate believes or the police are able to show that there is some other provision in the code which can be used to continue the detention, you can use that other provision and of course there is no mention of what the other provision, of course you can't do that but there is no mention of any other provision. So section 151, there was a situation in Delhi a few years back where most people were arrested under 151, so there is no bail, right, because 
there is no offence for which you have been uh, arrested. And uh, yeah, if you talk to these people and they ask you, when will I be eligible for bail? The answer is, I don't know, because we have not been charged for any offence yet. It was for, under suspicion that you may commit uh, an offence which the police officer is not really obliged to tell you what offence uh, he or she thought you would be uh, committing. Similarly, we have section 107 and 111 of the Criminal Procedure Code, which is now outside the judicial framework, judicial magistrate's framework, it's within the executive magistrate. So in all situations where the police believe that a person may disturb the peace, you can ask them to produce surety under section 107 and then 111. And if they don't give you that surety or the police think you, there's still going to be people who might cause uh, trouble, you use section 122 of the criminal procedure code and can keep them in custody for one year. So it's back to a, a preventive state where the Ram Navmi day before yesterday, or, uh, yeah, day before yesterday. So I think 100 people in this particular locality might be troublemakers. So I pick up those 100 people, put them in uh, prison, and I can keep them there for one year. Uh, because I think they might uh, offend. Similarly, there's a VIP, the Prime Minister is coming to uh, my city, so if I think this man or woman is going to uh, create trouble, so one year, no questions asked, because again, the Executive Magistrate, uh, the, the Superintendent of Police has to certify, the Executive Magistrate or the Deputy Commissioner has to put his or her seal of approval on that, and one year. Right. So, we have all of these provisions in our uh, criminal procedure code have been there for a while. We are introducing new ones there without really getting into when are these used, what are the rule of law uh, issues that arise here, is there any sort of accountability that the state has uh, in giving reasons as to why, uh, uh, why these provisions are, are being used. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, they are and will be used to target uh, individuals who the police believe as troublemakers. And troublemakers would also include people who dissent against the uh, against the state or who have a, uh, have an ideology which is um, opposite to what the uh, what the state has. So I I I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Building presentation, I think. Um, and what I'm going to speak about today is how progressive social movements have actually contributed to this kind of place, you know, uh, this kind of uh, carcerality and security state that we find ourselves in today. Starting with, of course, you know, this. Delhi gang rape in 2012, which we all know about, where a young woman was brutally raped, and she died of her injuries. Um, and a young man was also beaten and lay on the ground with a broken leg, no one actually helping him. Uh, their bodies dumped near Delhi's uh, listening new international airport. What's important, as you all remember, maybe, that there was uh, the event triggered a spontaneous protest all over the country, mostly in metropolitan cities. And also throughout the world, there was lots of anger, uh, and a committee was set up, the um, Varma Committee, to propose amendments to the criminal law. The, re the recommendations, although a bit over the top, they tried to deal with far too many things, um, were in fact nevertheless bold, and they sought to confront sexual violence through the discourse of rights, rights, which is a language that we're losing completely today. Um, foregrounding the rights to bodily integrity, sexual autonomy, and legalizing adult consensual sexual relationships. These are really bold moves. Um, and the position therefore challenged outdated, outdated notions of Indian womanhood, which was based on chastity, conservative sexual morality, honor, marriage, heterosexuality, and purity, which has framed almost all discussions on women's rights and laws dealing with sexual rights in post-colonial India. So it marked a really significant shift towards rights rather than wrongs, as far as women were concerned. The call for uh, a marital rape law and opposition to the demand for death penalty in cases of sex se sexual violence 
were also significant recommendations. As we all know, the Criminal Law Amendment Act was passed by Parliament where many of the key recommendations that would have advanced women's rights to gender equality and respect for women were simply ignored. Re the definition of rape was expanded um, and in important directions. Uh, however, the imposition of the death penalty where uh, rape leads to the death of the victim or permanent maiming, uh, sorry, maiming. Uh, the retention of Victorian provisions dealing with the outraging of, the wo of a woman's modesty, and most importantly, the exemption of marital rape from the purview of the criminal law were uh, the outcome of all of this activity. What I, what I suggest as a result of analyzing this, this amendment is that the new law really set up a legal edifice focused primarily on security, sexual surveillance and law and order, and left intact dominant gender arrangements which were based on discrete categorizations of male and female, as well as once again a conservative understanding of female sexuality as passive, as vulnerable, and encased in the stultifying interpretation of Indian cultural values. At the same time, what it also did, and this is going on around the world, is it augmented the muscular power of the state to regulate and discipline the sexual behavior of its citizens in the direction of fewer rights and more surveillance. One sort of small representation of uh, surveillance is to install CCTV cameras in buses and also have police, more police presence at the uh, bus stands. Here's the compelling question. Why is it over three decades of women's human rights advocacy, how is it that after three decades of women's human rights advocacy, did this appalling episode of violence against women come to be articulated within stable categories of gender and invite state intervention in the form of criminal justice, stringent, stringent sentencing, and a strengthened sexual security regime? Uh, I just want to, just a small um, aside, all four were prosecuted under the old law, and it worked, right? And so you have to ask, then why do we need all this new law? Um, so coming back to the three points I want to make in the talk today. First, I discuss how the carceral and sexual security regime produced by the daily rape is in part informed by ways, by the way in which gender and the gendered other have been pr predominantly addressed in international law and women's human rights advocacy. That gives us the context. Second, I want to trace the work that gender does in the area of international human rights and how it facilitates the rise of a sexual security regime. And I focus on three areas. I might not do all of these because they're so brief, but depending on the time, anti-trafficking, wartime rape, and the Rome Statute that set up the International Criminal Court, and the UN Security Council resolutions on gender, peace, and security. And thirdly, I return to the case of the Delhi rape to locate carceral feminism within the neoliberal term, uh, which we haven't really talked about much so far. Uh, in, in the previous sessions, and to illustrate how gender works with market interests in ways that are not necessarily emancipating, but nevertheless constitute our new definitions of freedom. Uh, and the question then becomes, can gender ever be a force for progressive change? Uh, gender in the international, let's just look at the context. The dominant narrative of gender in, um, I just say, international human rights law, IHL, is based on the reproduction of the idea of sex as a stable natural category and gender as socially constructed that can be altered and manipulated. Now this dichotomization has informed feminist advocacy as well as United Nations work in the area of what's called women's rights, uh, which continue to operate along a nature-nurture divide. This dominant narrative of sex and gender was initially put into crisis by the work of famous political uh, feminist theorist Judith Butler, who focused on sex as discursively and culturally produced in and through gender, rather than as something that's naturalized and pre uh, a naturalized pre-existing body. And she recast gender, quite controversially, as a repetitious performance simultaneously of the enactment, as well as a constant re-experiencing of a set of meanings that are socially attached to gender. Um, you know, it, it, going into a store, you'll see there's the men's section and the women's section. And the minute you go to the men's section, it's no, 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 you won't go over there. Right? That's one example of it. Or adver advertisement that reproduce gender stereotypes. Gender is an apparatus through which sex is produced and rendered as pre-discursive and normal, according to Butler. Um, 
Uh, queer theorists then subsequently have challenged the ways in which sex and sexuality have emerged in human rights advocacy within the universal dynamics of what's now called the gay international um, human rights movement. They expose the specific ways in which men who have sex with men, MSM, have been essentialized in this universalizing dynamic that has pushed through the LGBT rights as universal human rights at a global level. As some scholars explicitly point out, the focus on identity in LGBT uh, advocacy promotes a dominant model of Western sexuality that is underpinned, again, by gender dichotomization, men and women, masculine and feminine, male and female, as well as a hetero and homosexual binary. It also reduces the multiplicity of sexual identities and practices elsewhere in the world as a result of what's now called the imperialism of the global gay, how to be gay in the world. These critiques have all been valuable in understanding how gender, sex, and sexuality is structured within IHL. At the same time, the analytical insights of post-colonial feminism also enable us to understand how, gen how the gender other is constructed. While male and female bodies have been overwhelmingly understood in the international legal arena as naturally <coughs> different, these bodies have been further displaced onto what's a first world and third world divide, which operates to reinforce civilizational differences and cultural superiority of the West and the primitiveness of the other. This difference has been constructed against definitions and assumptions about colonial masculinity, uh, femininity, culture, and historical difference, as well as what and who constitutes the universal subject. These assumptions about culture, gender difference, and the other continue to inform the contemporary moment and how human rights becomes the new savior of victims from savages. We see this representation most explicitly in responses to women, for example, in Europe who wear the veil. And this has uh, been accentuated in the post 9 11 era where there's been this aggressive response in some Euro European countries to ban certain manifestations of the veil, which have been upheld uh, by the European Court on Human Rights, uh, most recently on the grounds of being able to live together, even though that's not a grounds in the Convention. The choice of the veiled woman is set against the coercive actions of the liberal democratic state that forces her to choose between the veil and participation in public life or access to state education, <coughs> when in fact, what she wants <coughs> is both. Gender equality comes to be associated with the unveiled body, non-freedom with the veiled body. Tradition and antiquity, cast as primitive and serving libidinous desires, are used to make moral <coughs> judgments about the native subject or the other. And such a focus not only reinforces the image of the other woman as victims, but also the idea of culture as an inherently negative feature of the third world. It also uses culture to deflect attention away from some of the systemic ways in which women's human rights are being undermined, for example, through current neoliberal economic processes. Gender remains this noun as something to be rescued by the universalizing project of human rights rather than a verb that works to reinforce the first world, third world divide and distinctions between us and them, men and women. Postcolonial feminists have then exposed how gender, the gender and other is often viewed as even more victimized, vulnerable, and in need of protection than her first world counterpart. And this has, of course, very serious implications for the strategies that are subsequently adopted to remedy some of the harms that women experience. And that is invariably focusing on rescuing women from the native man through stringent punishment, incarceration, and most importantly as well, cult further cultural stigmatization. Uh, the critique really rejects the dominant understanding of gender and sex as stable, and naturalized, and normalized, biologically embedded practices. It argues that gender takes many diverse forms and exists outside of Western specific models. Despite, however, the problematizing of these categories of gender and sexuality, as well as culture, by queer, feminist, post-colonial scholarship, Women's human rights advocacy, both domestically as well as internationally, continues to reinforce gender and sexuality as stable and essentialist categories, and this has specific consequences. Let me turn to the second point, which is the security discourse and regulation, disciplining, and management of gender in international human rights. Uh, so I want to now use these critical insights on gender that I've just discussed 
to move away from the idea of gender as a noun and instead to trace what work is gender doing in some of this human rights advocacy, women's human rights advocacy in particular. Let's first look very quickly at sex trafficking in international human rights law. The, the international human rights arena, in the international human rights arena, gender has been framed largely within the Violence Against Women's campaign. That's not what it was meant to be. In 1993, that's what it became. So it was all about violence against women rather than about rights, human rights of women. And that is something that states wholeheartedly endorse, which needs to make you very suspicious. Why were they doing this? Because, of course, it immediately meant they could turn to the criminal law to try and look good on gender, but also enhance their own power. Um, this approach has been very evident in anti-trafficking interventions ever since the 1990s that have been invariably conflated with anti-sex uh, work as well as anti-migrant agendas. They are the casualties of the anti-trafficking uh, 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 advocacy. The protocol on trafficking in persons in 2000 was, in, it was intended to extend beyond specific issues of prostitution. Um, but they've been used, unfortunately, by feminists and state actors to adopt laws that criminalize various components of the, of the sex industry and once again reinforce the notion of women as victims without agency, uh, especially third world women. And facilitating, again, increased surveillance power over cross-border movements, you know, strengthening of border controls and the presence of border personnel, police personnel, um, uh, at, at the borders. These responses demonstrate an increasing obsession with national security, law and order, border protection. In the context of globalization and free market ideology, I think we have to keep that context in mind. It's not just a state doing this because it's just accumulating more power. It's also alongside the intensification of the, and, and, uh, of, of the neoliberal agenda. Uh, and really, really not about the protection of women from traffickers and smugglers. So the anti-trafficking interventions partly illustrate how an entire regulatory regime can be established without necessarily addressing the problem that triggered its establishment, the exploitation of and violence against women who move or are moved across borders by clandestine networks of smugglers and traffickers. The interventions, in fact, produce an edifice that may be missing the point altogether. As in the case of the Delhi rape, such interventions did not and have not empowered women, but in fact, have strengthened the state regulatory apparatus, the criminal justice system, and intensified the sexual surveillance of women's lives. Turning quite briefly again to gender in the International Criminal Court, uh, in the processes of drafting the Rome Statute, there was a phenomenal, there were about 200 feminist groups that were present. Uh, and they quite single-mindedly, once again, focused on trying to prohibit rape in war and prosecute it vigorously. So once again, endorsing the sort of criminal approach to women's human rights. Uh, gradually, the feminist focus expanded to cover not only rape in the context of war in relation to belligerent uh, forces, but to view these things as part of a bigger global war against women. So the language of war, the language of, you know, uh, uh, of criminal law, the language of extreme punishment are part of the discourse of progressive groups. The argument was that the acceptability of rape in peacetime causes rape in conflict. This is sort of this causal connection without any attention to context. Uh, and based on a capacious understanding or conception of male domination, where rape was reimagined as part of a bigger male war against women. There's only one cause. Quite specifically, quite specifically, feminists wanted the ICC to have unlimited jurisdiction over sexual harms. It didn't get that, but that's what they wanted. Um, the goal was to address sexual violence through tougher criminal law responses, demanding more stringent sentences, making sex crimes, a uh, specific set, set of indictable offenses. The goal is to be partly achieved by using repressive at the repressive apparatus of the state to alter or eliminate a specific kind of behavior that harms women. And this harm can range from violent gang rape to sexually colored remarks to everything in between. I mean, that's really quite repressive and really quite curtailing of, uh, of, of a rights agenda. Uh, the end result is not only an alignment of progressive actors with the coercive aspects of the state regulatory structure, but also further entrenchment of gender arrangements where women are victims and men perpetrators in the context of war and conflict, 
regardless of the political, cultural, historical context and, and economic context, and of a conservative sexual morality where sex is per se considered as something that's dirty, unclean, and from which good and decent people need to be protected, and bad behavior incarcerated. Uh, it's a highly moralistic agenda, conservative moralistic agenda. And then finally, the Security, the Security Council resolutions on gender, peace, and security. It, it, they um, were designed to integrate women into the peace process in conflict and post-conflict contexts. Specifically, in quotes, encouraging the Secretary General to increase the participation of women at decision-making levels in conflict resolution and peace processes, and ensure the full, equal, effective participation of women at all stages. I might take a few minutes extra, if you're okay with that. Because yeah. I do want to make my neoliberal point. Okay. Um, uh, the, anyway, the, the Security Council resolutions were placing a strong emphasis on just getting women at the table, not necessarily speaking at the table. Um, but also mainstreaming gender throughout the UN system, which basically meant the actually eliminating gender difference and gender inequality in the process of mainstreaming. Uh, I'm going to skip to um, uh, just a quick summary of this. Um, what's important about gender, peace, and security, once again, represents women that should be at the table because they're nurturing, caring, gentle, they'll be really good in these kind of complex situations, again, essentializing uh, gender attributes. Women's groups and human rights groups have continued to imagine that the international national legal orders are heavily consolidated in this top-down understanding of sovereign power, focusing considerable attention on the criminal justice, law and order, and security apparatus. And by continuing to appeal to the state, which we constantly do, domestically and internationally, what they're doing is failing to attend to the consequences of such a strategy. And therefore, they're emerging more as a technocratic enterprise rather than a radical political movement uh, that facilitates and legitimates, legitimates uh, normative understandings of gender and again strengthening the state's power over uh, regulating uh, and, and surveying, disciplining gender. I want to just look at the um, gender in the context of the neoliberal term, which I think is needs to be understood as the context within which this turn to the criminal law and carcerality is happening. By look, revis let's revisit the, the rape of, uh, of Jyoti Singh Pandey, who, who, whose aspirations had inspired millions of women in this country, right? Uh, she had come from a lower income bracket. She was working to earn enough to help her, her siblings through uh, their school as well. It was an image of the aspiring Indian woman making a place for herself in the global economic order. And, and the collective presence of outraged young women on the Indian street after the rape marked a significant moment in the effort to inscribe the new generation within the neoliberal schema of gender. That was the new understanding of freedom, right? Freedom of choice within these neoliberal economic lifestyles. It challenged, and it's, uh, it, uh, I'm not entirely critical of this, because it challenged and defied traditional understandings of Indian womanhood and its accompanying stereotype positions about male, female, femininity, and masculinity. Audaciously declaring, I am not just your mother, daughter, sister, or wife, I'm a citizen and I demand equal rights. Some of the placards on the streets overtly distanced themselves from the familial understandings of Indian womanhood that has really shackled women's freedom in India ever since independence. So these slogans, slogans are really a powerful reminder of how in every crisis, rights are crucial for according recognition in law as well as in the public arena. But the problem is, it's not self-evident that this kind of, this kind of position um, emerged as part of a counter-hegemonic, radical political agenda uh, that reshaped gender norms and behaviors. In fact, the protests on the Delhi streets and elsewhere may have, as, as Greg, you have maybe mentioned, marked the arrival of a certain form of agency and female autonomy, which you say is part of the attributes of freedom, that appear to be free, or at least freer than earlier, but it is, in fact, fairly constituted within the parameters of neoliberal political rationality, which today provides the dominant contemporary frame for sovereignty within the context of gender and sexuality. Now, while this may be a more emancipated new generation that's invested in competing and consuming and experiencing its sovereignty without censorship or the interference of the 
bloated state apparatus, it somewhat paradoxically continues to appeal to the state to ensure the stability and security to facilitate the exercise of this freedom. In other words, make sure we get to go from point A on the bus to point B, our place of work, without any hassles. And whatever you have to do to do that, you know, do it. It's not necessarily about rights. At the same time, this freedom is embedded in the idea of the self-sufficiency of the individual and, su success and successful competition in the marketplace and the seductive and erroneous notion that the market is a space of free choice and inherently not coercive. Okay, so just to um, maybe try and conclude here, um, the security apparatus that was strengthened in light of the protests were partly propelled by market demands for stability and efficiency and hence greater policing. And in some ways, the interests of the protesters and the state uh, coincided in the sexual surveillance techniques and cultural measures that were ultimately adopted. And this convergence, convergence perhaps represents justice for women who are, in fact, exhausted from being pawed and groped and ogled in the public realm. But it also operates as a disciplining technique of modern power and a condition of legibility. The discussion raises, I think, very important questions about the possibility of, change, of, of gender and change through human rights. When the idea of state sovereignty is unpacked, and the processes of international human rights are exposed as already pursuing normative understandings of gender, does this not limit the possibility of realizing freedom, emancipation, and empowerment? Let me stop there. I did want to mention that some of the stuff I've been uh, presenting today is also part drawing from my uh, a book that I'm doing that's coming out by Edward Elder Press, um, and it's called Gender Alternity and Human Rights. Uh, the, um, so the title is, yes, Freedom in a Fishbowl. Uh, and it will be coming out early in 2018.